thank you everybody for, for staying so long after a long morning. Um, okay, we have quite a lot to do, so I'll begin straight away. Uh, first of all, some, uh, some language that we're going to need to talk about these uh, Shakespeare films. Um, uh, resetting um, is when um, we keep the text of Shakespeare, uh, we simply put it somewhere else. And uh, uh, a very famous example, 20 years old now, but it still seems very fresh, is this Baz Luhrmann film of Romeo and Juliet, which is set in a uh, fictitious Verona Beach uh, somewhere in the Americas. Actually filmed in Mexico City and Vera Cruz, a little bit in Florida. And that's a resetting Shakespeare's text, but somewhere else in place and in time. A retelling, and here I've chosen another famous example, is, um, does not follow, does not reproduce the words of Shakespeare. But the plot is there, the plot is recognisable, it may be adapted, it's always somewhere else in space and time, but um, uh, it's uh, a plot which is inspired by Shakespeare but doesn't follow the words of Shakespeare. And here we're in 1950s New York, and the Montagues and the Capulets are uh, two street gangs of Puerto Ricans and European immigrants. And you find retellings uh, cover the whole spectrum from serious, <coughs> tragic stories like this to the deliberately comic uh, like this, which is Romeo and Juliet reset as garden gnomes. Some well-known actors there, some well-known actors, you know, Michael Caine, Maggie Smith, Patrick Stewart, Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> now, um, yet another word we're going to use, uh, apart from um, resetting and retelling, is the word take, which you find associated with lots of these uh, Shakespeare films. A take, and I put it in bold there, um, is a very liberal uh, retelling, or it may be just a response to an interpretation of, um, and it covers all kinds of, uh, from uh, a, a retelling where we clearly recognise uh, the Shakespeare story to a reaction to a Shakespeare story. Uh, and we're going to look pretty soon at um, a little film called Star Crossed. Now, Star Crossed is one of those uh, very famous Shakespearean phrases. It comes from the prologue of Romeo and Juliet, where it says, from forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. And it's a phrase which is ever so famous. If you Google it or use any search engine uh, to find uh, star-crossed and you press news, you'll find that it is applied to all kinds of lovers by journalists from really tragic stories of uh, two lovers separated by ethnic or religious background to, and I looked yesterday, uh, Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt. <laughs> describe, and I can't think of anything really in common between Angelina and Brad and Romeo and Juliet except male and female. Um, I'll just tell you some things to look out for while we watch this film clip. Okay. Uh, the setting... Well, you'll see that it's um, two ice cream vans on an English beach. The plot, well, it's only a four-minute film, so it doesn't set out in any way to retell the plot of Shakespeare's play, but it does finish at a certain moment, and I want you to look out for where it finishes. The language, the language is extremely playful. You'll enjoy it. Um, it is poetic. Uh, lots of it is in rhyming couplets, which, of course, Shakespeare doesn't use in his plays. He used blank verse. Um, but uh, you'll find lots of rhymes. You'll find lots of nice, enjoyable imagery of ice creams, because there are two ice cream sellers, and seaside vocabulary. And um, you'll find that uh, there are echoes of rewritings, of revisitings of, uh, of lines from Romeo and Juliet. For example... In Romeo and Juliet, Romeo says when he sees in the famous balcony scene, you know, but soft what light from yonder window break, he goes on to say, Arise, fair sun, and kill the envious moon. That's what Shakespeare's Romeo says. In this film, 
Romeo says, she's neon sun next to monochrome. <laughs> Fairly obvious modernization, though. Um, and uh, Romeo, who speaks a very flowery language compared to Juliet's plain, sensible language, uh, still in the balcony scene, he says, or she says to him, oh, swear not by the moon, the inconstant moon, that monthly changes in her circle door, or do not swear at all. In this film, she says, please don't swear by the ferocious ocean, they're on the seaside, that haunts our fatal divide like poison. Swear it for real, seal your deal with a kiss. <laughs> and the very beginning of the prologue is, two households both alike in dignity, when I'll leave you to keep your ears open for how it's revisited in this film. Okay, gentlemen, in Juliet's balcony. <laughs> This English beach is where we lay our scene. Summer in reach and life is but a dream. Two houses both alike in common crime. Laced with bad blood and history divide. Flesh bites a bullet to the grey spit sheets. Revenge is bitter when the ice cream sweep. I can't help but stare at her from afar. By pistachio clouds and rum bar bar. Like halo hoop, she scoops the heads of cones. She is neon sun next to monochrome. When our shifts chime, loving eyes are mad fixed. Hearts clang at the spine, this oil water mix. And torture with the miracle I need. As the mirage of our strangles in weeds. Tiny shadows dancing under the moon. I wish we could enjoy this view from a room. Oh, ah, oh, she speaks. Say something, bright angel. Hey, Romeo! Romeo. I smell him in the night air, that gentle sting, electrifying snare. Why use the word hate? Use that word ever that carries such weight like seaside weather. They do not know of this Montague man. They see him just as a rogue in a van. But I see me in the veins of his eyes, in the knots of his heart, breath synchronized. Our families war with heritage hate, competitive arguing, bargaining rates. Steer these vans to the edge of land and break. Ring. 
hands on their fingers, the bloodline a fresh scene. Let love be their witness over ice cream. Good fun, isn't it? Well, do say yes. <laughs> uh, now, the plot was different, yes, because it cut off uh, at their running away together. Um, uh, you might indeed ask students to, uh, to plan a continuation of this particular story, uh, whether it will end in a, in a tragic way or in a different way. Uh, it's an open ending. Um, ideas for teaching? Well, I honestly don't think we've got time to actually do this as a, uh, as a workshop. I'll just tell you some of the things I thought of, and obviously you will think about it yourselves. Um, Yes, plan. Plan a resetting of this or any Shakespeare play. It's not so difficult to think of a different time or place to, to set a Shakespeare play. It gets more interesting if you think of a key scene uh, and reset it. Um, if you just concentrate on the balcony scene and work out how to reset it. It was cleverly done here um, in, uh, in Shakespeare's play. Uh, Juliet is up there, Romeo is down here. She doesn't know he's down here. She comes onto the balcony and she says, Ah, oh, me. And he says, oh, She speaks. Speak more, bright angel. Uh, in this version, she's fiddling with her earring and she says, Bloody thing. <laughs> and he says, Ah, oh, she speaks. <laughs> um, rather amusing. And, as a very advanced thing to do, uh, as I showed you, take some of the key lines, the classic lines, and see if you can rewrite them poetically, as was done here. Twelfth Night. Now, um, what happens in Twelfth Night? Anybody who sets out to summarise briefly uh, the plot of a Shakespeare play <laughs> is rather foolish. Um, I have to do that to give you some background. Uh, Duke Orsino is in love with Olivia. Olivia is recently widowed and does not return his love at all. Uh, young Viola arrives, uh, shipwrecked on, um, at, the, uh, at the town where the action takes place. Uh, she seeks employment with Duke Orsino disguised as a boy. Uh, Duke Orsino sends this boy to Olivia to carry on his suite, and Olivia falls in love with him, her. <laughs> and Olivia Cesario, um, meanwhile, falls in love with Duke Orsino, Orsino, but can't reveal her love because she's dressed as a boy. So you get these delicious complications that you do in Shakespeare when you get uh, a young boy actor acting the part of a female who's pretending to be a boy, <laughs> which makes life complicated and interesting. <laughs> now, um, when, when the play opens, Duke Orsino is the typical lovesick lover, uh, seeking, seeking solace in, in music, just like you might listen to the blues today. If music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it that surfeiting the appetite my sicken and so die. That strain again, it had a dying fall. Um, he's losing himself in music and hoping that he has so much of it that he'll get sick of it in the same way that he might, he hopes, get sick of love. Now, um, we're going um, to watch just a, a beginning, just a little bit of um, a version, no, of a take. <laughs> it really is a set of... Um, uh, musicians um, rapping inspired by Twelfth Night. Uh, I want you to listen out for uh, takes on the theme of love and music and wanting to have too much of it and not being able to have too much of it. Uh, I want you to listen out to references to this complicated plot of people dressed up as different sexes and falling in love with each other. Um, rap music samples. It takes extracts, it takes quotations and repeats them. Here we're going to see this fellow is wise enough to play the fool, a phrase which one of the singers particularly likes and repeats and repeats over again. And uh, listen out for the unmissable phrase. Uh, 
which is a term of approval here, all right? Um, Juliet. Love is fickle, got me picking petals, does she love me not? Music is the only thing that drowns the pain that's got to stop on What is love? How can it be love if only one's in love? It's unrequited, maybe this is just a crush I wanna tell her how I feel but I can't take rejection How do I face unhappiness? How do I face depression? Music is the only healing process, it's the only cure The only medication that can stop me going overboard I like her, but she likes someone other, another Man, but that man doesn't love her That man was a woman Disguised as her brother And she likes me But I don't know if she's undercover uh, She could have told me I could have played it cool This fellow's wise enough to break the rules uh, This fellow's wise enough to play the fool This fellow's wise enough to play the fool Better a witty fool Than a foolish wit Education is the key I'm trying to school the kids from Hamlet Twelfth night Romeo and Juliet I hereby make clear that Shakespeare's as cool as shit Let me alone for swearing How can I show I'm caring? People always judge you by your looks and by the clothes you're wearing Love is fickle I can taste the flavours like I'm sucking skittles I sent my messenger with a riddle uh, And he sent that on He was gone So if music be the food of love we play on Let the song be begun Let the music play on I said if music be the food of love the play on Nothing's worse than love when the feeling is isn't mutual. The other person has to feel the same and that is crucial Love's truthful and the truth hurts or love's brutal It's unusual, I love my music because it's beautiful Imagine I am Adam, you were Eve, soon as we believe alike Thank you, it's seven minutes we have to stop there I'll just give you a sum Ferociously entertaining, isn't it? Do say yes <laughs> um, <coughs> That was filmed, by the way, in the Sam Wanamaker Theatre uh, Which is a recent addition to the Globe Theatre in London uh, and that is a, a replica of the inside theatre that Shakespeare used, um, for example, in his late plays. Um, having an inside theatre allowed him to do a lot more uh, supernatural tricks. Um, well, we're coming on to Macbeth in a minute. For teaching, well, the simplest thing I can think of is to choose, again, key lines. I mean, here, uh, if music be the food of love was chosen, and wise enough to play the fool, just choosing particularly emblematic lines as, as epigraphs, and for um, very clever work to try and create a rap. It's quite interesting to uh, compare um, uh, rap and Shakespeare's blank verse. I mean, Shakespeare uh, doesn't use rhyme in the plays, certainly in the sonnets. Uh, he uses rhyme brilliantly, but in, in the plays, blank verse, the, um, the ten syllables, uh, the five stresses, <coughs> Rhyme is only used for people when they go mad or for fools. And yet, in the 20th century, the 21st century, it is the form of popular music. I can't think of any pop song uh, in the last uh, 100 years or more that doesn't rhyme. Okay, where should we go now? Uh, it's, a, it's a female part. <laughs> Although it would, of course, be a boy dressed as a... It's, 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 it's Lady Macbeth. It's Lady Macbeth. Now, here we're going to look at uh, a simple bit of resetting. It's actually got Shakespeare's words. Um, the plot so far, well, 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 uh, Duncan, King Duncan, is coming to stay at the Macbeths. And she and her husband, Macbeth, have planned to kill Duncan. She suspects Macbeth doesn't have the stuff in him to do it. He's got too much of the milk of human kindness. Uh, and uh, she delivers the soliloquy that we'll hear in a minute. Now, there's two kinds of soliloquy, basically, in Shakespeare. Uh, the early stuff, like in Richard III, where you have the, the, the character sharing his or her thoughts with the audience, like a pantomime villain. You know, now is the winter of our discontent. He's talking to the audience, inviting the audience to collude, and then, and then somebody else comes and he says, dive thoughts down to my soul. The more mature kind of uh, oscillatory is a character thinking aloud, um, to be or not to be. This is not addressed to the audience. It's not, oi, listen to this. 
to be or not to be, what do you think? No, no, it's a character thinking out loud. And this, should we say, is the more mature kind of soliloquy that you find in Hamlet, Antony and Cleopatra, Macbeth, the later plays. Uh, now, Duncan is coming. They're plotting to kill him. And Lady Macbeth delivers this soliloquy where she says, the raven himself is hoarse that croaks in the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts, unsex me here and fill me from the crown to the toe, top full of direst cruelty. She's calling upon evil spirits, as it says quite explicitly, to make her cruel and unfeminine, unsex me here. Now, and uh, it continues in, uh, in this faith, continuing to say, yes, make me cruel, make me unfemale. Now, a question to ask ourselves with Macbeth, is all the supernatural stuff like the witches, Banquo's ghost, um, pieces like this, are the evil spirits, are the ghosts, uh, are the witches real, objectively real, or are they like metaphors for uh, the way that the Macbeth feel? Um, are they symbolic, or do they actually exist? Well, you tell me the interpretation in this clip, okay? The raven himself is horse that croaks the fatal entrance of Duncan under my battlements. Come, you spirits that tend on mortal thoughts. Unsex me here. Fill me from the crown to the toe top full of direst cruelty. Make thick my blood. Stop up the access and passage to remorse that no compunctuous visitings of nature shake my fell purpose nor keep peace between the effect and it. Come to my woman's breasts! Take my milk for gall, you murdering ministers, wherever in your sightless substances you wait on nature's mischief. God, sick night and pour thee in the dunnest smoke of hell that my keen knife see not the wound it makes nor heaven peep through the blanket of the dark to cry hold hold okay well quite clearly they exist don't they the evil spirits here <laughs> they quite clearly exist um, uh, we have something that you can do in the cinema, but you can't do on stage. We have the point of view shot. That is, we, we have the point of view of the evil spirits arriving at her house. Um, we had that kind of manga-like style cartoon bit in the middle, which wasn't, uh, which is, should we say, an objective interpretation. And at the end, she did look a different woman than she looks at the beginning of the scene. Um, for teach, well, uh, you could imagine how to film other scenes from Macbeth. It's something Macbeth related. Uh, I'm interested um, in the way soliloquies can be performed, though, in many more different ways on film than on stage. On stage, unless something extraordinary is happening in some other part of the stage, you always look at the person who's speaking. Uh, and that's basically it. But with a film, uh, you can have the character speaking or you can have voice over. 
You hear the voice on the soundtrack, but, uh, but the person is not speaking. So it actually does replicate a person thinking aloud. Or you can have a mixture of the two. Uh, the camera can look at the character who is speaking, or the, char- the camera can look at what the character is looking at, or you can see images from a completely different point of view, uh, like the manga style um, uh, Lady Macbeth being possessed by spirits. So planning a soliloquy, um, what parts are spoken aloud, what parts are voice over, what the camera does when the soliloquy is being spoken um, is a very nice film-related activity you can do with any Shakespeare uh, soliloquy. Ah, okay. Um, The Tempest. Gosh, how to tell you briefly what has happened. Well, (laughs) we're on uh, an island which is inhabited by a man called Prospero and his daughter, Miranda. Uh, She's 15. Um, When she was a little girl, Prospero, who was the Duke of Milan, was exiled by his ambitious and cruel brother and set, set adrift at sea. And uh, they landed on this island, which was inhabited just by a a savage creature known as Caliban. In the last 13 years or so, Prospero has been refining his expertise as a magician. And uh, he's been bringing up his daughter. And uh, as luck has it, his evil usurping brother is sailing quite close to the island and Prospero, with his magic arts, summons up a tempest, hence the name of the play, uh, and the brother and his associates are shipwrecked, and Prospero starts taking revenge. And that's all we need to know, all we have time to know so far. <laughs> um, Miranda's mother is mentioned just once. Thy mother was a piece of virtue, and she said, Thou wast my daughter. And that is all that Prospero says to Miranda about her mother. An undeveloped character. We're going to look uh, at, uh, at this revisiting. It's shot in Devon, uh, which is where I was born and brought up, by the way. That is Prospero, and we're beginning here. My dearest girl, you are here by my side, sleeping quietly, your small hands thrown above your head, your fists tightly clenched. You look so peaceful. Who are you now, now that you are old enough to read this letter? I know you will be clever like your father, and I am sure you will be strong. I can tell that already, even though you are still so small. Has your father still got his head in a book? I know the answer to that question. I hope he is taking good care of you. 
I trust absolutely that he will try his best to do so. But he lives in a world of his own. I'm sorry I'm not there to brush the tangles from your hair and to pick you up when you fall. I cannot express how heartbroken I am that I will not be there with you on your journey. My darling girl. I'm lying here, trying to think of just one piece of advice that I can give to you. One thought that you can turn to when you need me. It is a brave new world which you will be exploring. But I think, more than anything else, what I want to say to you is, don't be afraid. I am with you. I am kissing your sleeping forehead. I give you this kiss to keep forever. My Miranda. My wonder. I love you. Your mother. You lost something? No. moving I find that it's lovely now um, in Miranda's letter uh, a letter from Miranda's mum uh, written shortly after her birth and for some reason we don't know uh, she disappeared from the scene um, letters are uh, are very interesting I think in literature and in life letters are where people write the truth and that's an interesting thing about letters and journals. This is where people come clean. This is where people set the record straight. This is where <coughs> unemotional people like Darcy and Pride and Prejudice reveal their emotions. It's a site. It's a place <coughs> where people do not dissemble anymore. Um, and uh, letters uh, during the course of reading a book or reading a play, you can ask students to write letters from practically anybody to anybody. And they will be writing the truth, their real feelings. Uh, and they will be writing to an interlocutor or to, to somebody with a sense of, <coughs> um, of identity. And it will be for a purpose. And the purpose will generally be revealing emotions. And it can be somebody <coughs> who is a minor character in the text whom you can make Major Shakespeare himself does it in um, uh, in his source for Macbeth, which is Holinshed's history of Scotland. Um, it just says in one sentence, Macbeth had a wife who was extremely ambitious. Full stop, and that's it. That's Lady Macbeth, and Shakespeare takes that character and makes that character into Lady Macbeth. So minor characters can be expanded upon in a big way, and journals. Here, we don't have uh, Miranda's own journal, but here, as if for any character, you can imagine them <coughs> writing a journal, which can be a day in my life, uh, which could be based upon the text or completely imagined, um, where we have no evidence for a way a character spends a day. Don't forget to include what the character thinks and does, and it can be an everyday day in the life of Hamlet or Juliet or whatever, or it can be exceptional. It could be Juliet's ordinary day until that evening that she meets Romeo. Uh, journals and letters, I think, are very, very good ways of getting inside characters. Now, I should finish now, and I will finish now, Mark, don't worry. <laughs> um, I'll give you uh, a little bit of homework to do, though. Um, because these, uh, these eight or nine um, uh, Shakespeare Lives films contain, gosh, the very moving 
uh, as I think we saw with Miranda's letter to the, uh, to the playful, as with um, Star-Crossed, to the dramatic, as with Lady Macbeth, to the comic. Now, who could that be, and what play might that be? And I will give you 10 seconds to make a guess now. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 that would be... Three, two, one. It's Hamlet. <laughs> I hope that intrigues you. Well, we've got time just for one minute of it, please. Sorry, I've got to click on. Am I? Yeah. He's a student coming home from university. Well, of course, Hamlet is a student coming back from university. To the Prince of Denmark pub. <laughs> uh, with his favourite oh, lampshade. Oh, darling, look at you. So, what next, my grown-up boy? Don't know, maybe travelling, Laos or somewhere. Well, there's a glass collecting job with your name on it. Those student loans won't pay for themselves. Can I just borrow some more money? Let's see what your father says, shall we? Mum, Dad's dead. <laughs> Uncle Claude, <laughs> Mum, we've just had Dad's funeral. Aren't you a bit old to be moving back home, boy? Don't be silly. Didn't they teach you to wash your own hands at uni? Happy families, don't we? Remember? <laughs> Pause. Oops. I wanted it a second before, but there you go. Of course, what happens next is the ghost of Hamlet's father appears. Well, it's a semi-surprise now. <laughs> Boy! Ah! Put it away! Dad? Avenge me! Aren't you dead? I am your fool! He killed me! Who? Oh, my brother! Your uncle! He poisoned me! He stole my wife! And my pup! This ain't happening. The beast on the world! <laughs> okay, now, uh, as you can see, this is a comic revisiting of Shakespeare. But Shakespeare is so extraordinarily monumental, there's nothing you can do to diminish uh, diminish Shakespeare. You can make as much fun as you like. And it's clever fun because it reduces the plot into four minutes. I'll leave you to, uh, to explore that uh, at home on, on your computers. Mark, if you'd like to... We all have our entrances and our exits. But my time has run out, so... Uh, thank you. Thank you.